will have to watch our language. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Are you going to be preaching from up there? Uh, I'm going to preach from the floor here. Okay. I'm going to sit up here where I can see you then. Good idea. <laughs> I don't know. What, there's not much to look at? Is that what you're trying to say? No. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, he can't see you both. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> true. What he does, he recognizes his voice. He's going to hear his voice. I'm hoping that I'm, that I'm in the frame, so we'll see. Well, it looks like it. That thing's in front of me. I better move. No, you're not in the way of it. Well, because... It's in my way, though. The way Facebook... They want me to install the app, and I'm against installing apps that I don't need. <laughs> yeah, because that's the issue with the iPad. If you're trying to watch this on the iPad, you need to have the Facebook app on your iPad. Right. Okay. And I don't, and so now if I try to watch myself... So what are you watching yourself on, and then if you're not watching on Facebook? Well, I don't watch myself normally. No, if you on your iPad, if you wouldn't have that Facebook app, what would you be watching it on? Uh, I would just use my computer oh. and watch it that way. Okay. So, Come on, uh, people. hopefully everybody can hear me. I have the microphone plugged in, so that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, you have a strong voice. Yeah, well, the phone, the microphone on the phone itself is not quite as strong you know, as you think it would be. Um, even if we're this close, if I were to unplug this microphone and go through the camera microphone, it, it still wouldn't quite be as good. Do I need to be on that side? No, you can sit wherever. Right. Not, not a problem. Um, yeah, so, and if you're watching on the live stream, uh, I can't see anything that you're saying right now, so I apologize for that. Um, if the internet should go out, and I have already had one issue with it this morning, um, if it should go out, I'm sorry, um, if it goes out, it's still recording on my phone, so I'll put that video up later. Um, I have found that to be the case. If the internet drops, it'll still record, and then I can upload it later. So I apologize for that if you're watching the live stream and it goes out, sorry. But you guys are going to be fine. <laughs> if the live stream stops, I'm going to kick everybody out and say, Bible study's over. No. <laughs> I mean, are our voices on that? Uh, it's possible, yeah. Um, it's, of course, closer to me, but this is what they call an omnidirectional microphone, which means all directions. So um, that is something to be aware of. But probably I'll only get myself in trouble. That's the intention. We'll see how it goes. Somebody who has the Facebook app on their phone may want to check and see if I, I'm actually standing in the camera. Yep, I can see that you. might be good. I can see you. You're right in the middle. Okay, good.
like with your eyes or on your phone? Well, okay. <laughs> okay, good. And hopefully people can hear me. That's excellent. Well, welcome back to in-person Bible study. We haven't had, uh, you know, really in-person study like this since March? March. March, and it's now June. So uh, hopefully I remember how to do it. Uh, we're, we're thankful for technology to be able to, you know, we were able to get together uh, over the, the internet, you know, over the last couple months, and, and some of us are probably still joined by a live stream right now, and that's, that's fantastic. Uh, for a little while, we will continue the live stream. Um, I don't know the legality of live stream and Bible study. I, I don't know how that, how that works, um, especially as we're using the Book of Concord here. So we'll see. Maybe I'll reach out to CPH and see what they say. I've done this before where I've gotten a hold of them and see what they think about it. So uh, that said, we will dive in. Uh, if you're joining us on the live stream, welcome. Uh, hopefully, uh, I'll be clear where we are as we, we go along because we are going to begin something new today. Uh, but as we always do, we begin with prayer. Uh, and I really like my handy dandy book here, The Lutheran Prayer Companion which is a collection of prayers from Lutheran history, uh, dating back even to the 1500s. And I mentioned in my sermon, what, last night and then on Sunday, that you know, Trinity Sunday, which was this last Sunday, uh, dates back at least to the 1300s. And, and 1332 is the day that sticks in my head that whichever pope said, this has got to be Trinity Sunday. Uh, and the Germans... Uh, at this time, there was no Lutheran church as we know it, uh, but the German territory churches, they, they switched to Trinity Sunday, but they kept the gospel reading from John chapter 3. Uh, and so uh, we kind of had that going in, and well, there's two prayers in here. There's one for Trinity Sunday, and then there's another one for Trinity Sunday that's based on John chapter 3. And that's the one that I think I will use. So, let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we poor sinners confess that nothing good dwells in us, and if left to ourselves, we must perish in sin and eternal death, since that which is born of the flesh is flesh and cannot see your kingdom. But we beseech you to be gracious and merciful, and send your Holy Spirit into our hearts for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, and make of us new men that we may confidently believe in the forgiveness of sins through Christ as promised to us at our baptism, and daily increase in charity toward our neighbor and all other Christian virtues, until at last we obtain salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, welcome back everyone again. Uh, today we're going to begin a new chunk of the Book of Concord. Now, now that you all have books of concords a uh, 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 book of concords available to you i put some back on the pew there um, i've got the first edition up here anybody would like the first edition uh, i've also got the cold wanger uh, as well uh, if you're watching on the live stream and you don't have uh, one of these book of concords available to you you can go to our website which is st john's and grace lp.com uh, when you go there, there should be some sort of a tab that says resources for those at home. Uh, if you click on that and then scroll down, you'll get to something called the Augsburg Confession. Uh, that's what you're going to want. Uh, it's going to be an older translation, but it is a goodie. Uh, so if you want to follow along at home using that, uh, please do. Uh, but before we dive into the Augsburg Confession, I think we should spend some time talking about the history, because there is a lot of history going on. Uh, you know, most of us uh, in our confirmation, uh, we, we talk about Martin Luther, maybe, yeah, at least with, with the class here, we do talk about Martin Luther, we talk mostly about the Bible and about the Catechism, but some about Martin Luther, uh, and we get some history, but not a whole ton, right? Uh, does anybody know... Okay, uh, I did put this sheet back there, so if, so if you grab this, uh, don't look at it. Uh, <laughs> when did Luther post the 95 Theses? 15. 
15, 17, yeah, <laughs> took a little while there, I had to go back to uh, my confirmation. 15, 17, right? Uh, now we just did the small and large catechisms, and those came out in 1529. Uh, the Augsburg Confession, as we're gonna be talking about today and for a little while yet, <clears throat> that came out in 1530. Uh, and then the Book of Concord, this thingy, uh, first edition here, uh, this came out in 1580. Uh, and knowing what we know about the world, uh, we can be confident that nothing happened between 1517 and 1580, right? <laughs> Literally nothing happened other than the, the printing press and things. Well, the printing press was before Luther, but uh, nothing happened between 1517 and 1580, right? Uh, well, no, uh, it's, it's not quite as cut and dry as that. Uh, there is a lot going on in history, uh, in the world, uh, and in Germany in particular. Uh, so if you back here, in back the sanctuary here, I made a, a little timeline that I didn't actually make this myself, I stole it uh, from the, the reader's edition of the Book of Concord. But let's, let's walk through this a little bit because this starts to put things in perspective. Uh, if you're watching online, um, I'll maybe put it on our website later. Uh, it's going to look something like, like this, maybe. Uh, if you have the, the reader's edition of the Book of Concord, uh, this is in there, uh, right before the Oxford Confession. This is in there. So uh, if you have the reader's edition, you have this already. Uh, and it actually starts at 1521. Uh, well, let's back up a little bit. When did Luther post the 95 Theses? 1517, right? Um, what was it that prompted the posting of the 95 Theses? What was the big issue? Does anybody remember? Yeah, right. We know uh, John Tetzel, right? Um, you know, in the handsome Luther movie, he's what played by a... Uh, Oh, some famous actor, right? And, uh, you know, the, he, John Tetzel was, uh, you know, an excellent seller of indulgences. Uh, he uh, had formerly been on what we would know as the Inquisition, I guess the Roman version of the Inquisition. Uh, but an indulgence, uh, if we don't remember, uh, an indulgence was a piece of paper uh, which essentially said that the the punishments that the the temporal punishments that are deserved for your sins are remitted and what that means if you buy an indulgence either for yourself uh, or for your your relatives uh, that gets them out of purgatory uh, assuming that they died in a state of grace uh, you in Roman Catholic theology then and now if you die in a state of grace you don't go to heaven, you go to purgatory first. Uh, or, and maybe that's, I'm mixing this up, but you go to purgatory where the, there is still some punishments due, there's still some cleansing due for your sins. So you go to purgatory to be, to be purged of, of your, the disorder caused by your sins. And uh, that could be a million years, uh, it could be a billion years in purgatory. It could be five years in purgatory. But if you bought an indulgence, it would certainly be less uh, than it would have been otherwise. Uh, and this went on for a long while. And Luther, you know, among others, uh, came to the conclusion that this is not scriptural. You know, this is not in, in the scriptures. Neither purgatory nor indulgences are in the scriptures. Uh, and the way that, that common people understood it was that an indulgence was buying the forgiveness of sins, which is not technically true, uh, but that's the way a lot of people understood it. So uh, Luther wrote down uh, these 95 theses uh, on indulgences, but on, also on other topics like repentance and also the, uh, the authority of the Pope, you know, and uh, Luther makes the zinger of, uh, you know, the Pope has the, the ability to free people from purgatory. Why doesn't he do it just for love instead of for money. You know, I forget which one that one is, but it's a pretty good singer. Uh, so you can look up the 95 theses and, and, and read them there. That happens in 1517. 
And Luther's original intention with the 95 Theses was to open up a dialogue. You know, uh, his intention wasn't, all right, let's start a fight. You know, but no, it, it, was, it was originally meant to, to lead to an academic dialogue over this topic, because Luther was not interested in, in breaking from the church, uh, but rather he saw these as uh, barnacles, right? Uh, I'm not a boater, but barnacles, you know, you grow on, on, on a boat and you have to get them off, right? Uh, some of those had developed, and so Luther wanted to, to address that. Uh, and instead what Luther got was a papal bull. And uh, the papal bull uh, essentially said, Luther, you're in a lot of trouble. And you better take back what you said or else. And uh, that happened in 1519. Uh, eventually, then, uh, Luther gets another papal bull, uh, and that's where our timeline picks up here. Uh, and that's in 1521. And the, and the papal bull says, all right, Luther, for real this time, uh, you either take back what you said uh, and fall in line with church teaching, uh, or you don't get to go to heaven. You know? uh, so they had this thing called a diet, uh, or, uh, which is not what we call a diet. A diet is an imperial gathering of the emperor uh, and, and the different uh, governors and kings and things like that. Uh, and they got together, and uh, this happens in the Luther movies, whether it's in the old one or, or in the handsome Luther one. You know, Luther is, uh, you know, his works are brought in and placed on a table, and they say, Luther, uh, do you recant? And Luther says, nope. You know, uh, he says it in more words than that, but essentially says, you know, uh, unless I am proven from Scripture that, that I'm in error, then, then no, I, I, I don't recant. Uh, and what happened then is Luther became uh, excommunicated. Uh, he also became an outlaw, uh, which means... Uh, not only was Luther locked out of the church, he could no longer receive the sacraments uh, and uh, wouldn't go to heaven. Uh, he was an outlaw, which means uh, people could, if they caught Luther, they could kill him and not get in trouble for it. Uh, so uh, that entered upon a, a very hard time for Luther. In fact, he had to go into hiding at, at different points. Uh, but he was being protected uh, because in, uh, in Germany in the 1500s, there was more, it wasn't just a unified country, right? But there was about 500 of these things called, ooh, they were called oohs. Um, they were called like, like duchies, and they were like little tiny kingdoms or counties. And each was ruled by its own ruler. Uh, and these rulers had, had some power uh, and could afford some protections. And so Luther, who was in Saxony, which is where Wittenberg was, uh, was protected uh, as long as he was in that, that region. Uh, and what happened after 1521 is uh, when Luther was excommunicated, do you think that stopped him, by the way? Uh, no. And, and do you think that it stopped the spread of, of Luther's teaching? Well, it didn't do that either. You know, instead, uh, little by little, uh, it spread. Uh, the Lutheran teaching, the pure preaching of, of the gospel spread. Uh, those who had formerly been Roman Catholic priests and preachers uh, began teaching uh, the true gospel. Uh, congregations began, uh, you know, hearing and receiving that. Uh, you know, the, the whole thing was becoming, uh, you know, kind of rejuvenated little by little by little. Uh, now, on the uh, on the timeline here on the sheet, it mentions this guy Anabaptist Thomas Munzer. Uh, he's famous because he was one of the first to preach against infant baptism. We'll leave that on the shelf. And, uh, suffice it to say, other people start to latch on. When Luther gets excommunicated uh, and uh, doesn't really stop him, other guys latch on. Right? And uh, there's other Reformation movements that start now and go on. Uh, 1524, uh, there is this peasants, uh, now they're being nice and calling it a war. Uh, Luther called it a revolt. And if you've seen the handsome Luther movie, I'm talking the, I think it's the 2003, it's just called Luther, and it's got like Joseph Fiennes as Martin Luther, you know, much more handsome than he was in real life. Um, they portray this, that there's a scene in the, in the midway of the movie where 
uh, he happens upon a church that's filled with smoke and dead people. Um, you know, the, glass, the stained glass was all broken. You know, the altar was torn to pieces. All the crosses were broken. The statues were beheaded and things like that. Um, this happened because, uh, well, Munzer, among others, uh, stirred up the peasants to revolt against the church and against, uh, you know, the... Yeah, I guess the ruling class, there was some politics in here as well. Uh, it was very violent. Many people died. Eventually the army had to get called in and that made it worse. Uh, well, it stopped the revolt, but uh, there was a lot of death. Uh, and initially that was in the name of you know, Reformation. And it, and it was really terrible. Uh, that goes down. Uh, but little by little, the Lutheran gospel, the Lutheran teaching of scripture, uh, it, it's, it spreads uh, and it grows. Uh, little by little, kind of town by town, uh, some towns take to Lutheran preaching, some towns are resistant to it. Uh, and so it just spreads little by little. Now, 1525, that's a good date to know because we're about two days away from what happens on June 13th in 1525. Yeah, yeah. Luther marries Katarina von Bora. Now, Luther was much older uh, than, than Katie. Uh, Luther was born in 1483. Katie wasn't born until like 1499, maybe? Maybe in the, in the 1500s. So he was, uh, other than how they portray him in the movie, he, he was much older uh, than her. Uh, but they had a, a long, for their time, and, and successful and fruitful marriage. Um, in fact, there's some books written on that, on Katie Luther and, and Martin Luther, on, on their relationship. Very fantastic. Uh, that happens in 1525. Now, 1526, this is an important date. Uh, it says the Diet of Spire. Uh, <coughs> now, a diet, as I said before, is an imperial gathering. Uh, the emperor comes with his entourage, uh, the different governors of the different areas of the empire, they come, and they all get together. Uh, and at this diet, um, there is basically a showdown between the princes who are Lutheran and the princes who are Catholic because uh, the Pope doesn't necessarily like that well, he doesn't like that the, uh, the teachings of that German monk Luther are spreading and so there's resistance to Lutheran preaching, uh, uh, including violence uh, including violence and this diet is called together to try and hammer things out. And by hammer things out, they mean all you Lutherans stop being Lutherans and, and be Catholic again. Uh, and actually, uh, the Lutherans win the day uh, at, at this diet. Uh, and uh, essentially what comes out of this diet, and, and I won't give it in the Latin because I forget it, uh, but they come up with this idea uh, whoever is region, his religion. And they basically say, uh, Whatever the religion of the prince is, that's, that's what that region is going to be. You know, and so if you have a Lutheran prince, you're going to have a Lutheran you know, county. If you have a Catholic prince, you're going to have a Catholic county. Uh, and what that does is it kind of opens the floodgates you know, for the Lutherans even more. And they, uh, it spreads even more. And what starts happening now is the Lutherans are starting to get organized. And they start what are called visitations. Uh, where Luther and others go to the different congregations and they kind of evaluate what's going on in the congregation. Uh, what books is the priest reading? Uh, how is the congregation? What do they need to learn? Uh, what strange things are they doing? Um, so we're in June, which means pretty soon we're going to have the Corpus Christi Parade. Uh, and the Corpus Christi Parade, if you're familiar with Roman Catholicism, that's where they take uh, you know, a consecrated host or a transubstantiated host and they put it in, you know, in a monstrance and, and, and carry it around like this where it's a parade. Uh, you know, and that was going to be going on. And there were some Lutheran congregations that maybe, hey, might have been doing that. Uh, and so the visitations would kind of square that out. Um, you know, there would have been some Lutheran congregations that were still receiving in one kind. Uh, but, you know, as they became Lutheran, they started receiving in both kinds again. Right? So changes are going on. Uh, liturgically, you know, in, in the sermons and things like that, uh, and Lutheranism is is spreading now. 
1529, we know that because Luther publishes the small and large catechism. Uh, what also what happens in 1529 on the sheet here is there is a second Diet of Spire. So the emperor calls another get together with himself, his entourage, and his princes. And in the intervening years, between 1526 and 1529, uh, Emperor Charles V sacked Rome. I don't, you don't hear about that too much in, in your history books, but Rome has been sacked a few times. And, uh, and he actually took the Pope uh, as a hostage uh, and took him back to Bologna, uh, which is somewhere in Italy, in Italy right? Um, see, the, the Pope, ever since Charlemagne, uh, and even some today, uh, saw himself as the world superpower. You know, the Pope was the kingmaker. If you want to be the emperor, you need to fall in line because the Pope was the one who made you the emperor. And uh, Charles, uh, at this point, was young, and uh, although he was a faithful Catholic, uh, he and the Pope did not always see eye to eye. Uh, and it ended up uh, in him sacking Rome and taking the Pope captive. Uh, they eventually came to terms uh, and, and made friends, uh, but what ended up happening then is, whereas before the emperor had a lot going on and a lot of plates spinning, and he couldn't really focus on Lutheranism, uh, now that the pope and the emperor made up, now the emperor could turn his, his efforts towards stamping out the Lutherans. Uh, and that started to happen. In 1529, there's the second Diet of Spire. And that really cool thing where whoever is the prince of the area, whatever his religion is, that's what it's going to be, that goes away. And all of a sudden it becomes a lot more dangerous to be a Lutheran and to host Lutherans. Uh, the word Protestant, which nowadays I would not apply that to us, to Lutherans, or you know, when I think Protestant, I think Presbyterians, Methodists, things like that. Uh, originally that term applied to us who protested the Second Diet of Spire, where they said, you Lutherans, you've got to stop doing that. That goes down in 1529, and like I said, it becomes a little bit more dangerous to be a Lutheran. Um, and the wheels start to turn in some of the princes' heads that this is a time in the 1500s where it is not uncommon to go to war for religious reasons. You know, we live in a world now where uh, you, know, you have your politics and your religion, your, your peanut butter and, and your bananas. And you, know, and you don't mix those, right? Uh, but everybody in this time was Elvis, and so they made peanut butter and banana sandwiches. Um, you know, your politics and your religion went together. Um, and some of the German princes realized that now that the emperor and the pope have made up, who both have armies, uh, who both are against us Lutherans, maybe we need to start standing up for ourselves and make some sort of alliance that at the very least is a deterrent to the Pope and the Emperor coming with their armies and making us not be Lutherans. Uh, and so they get together. Uh, and it says here, the Schwabach Articles are drafted. And this comes from a gathering in a German town called Schwabach, where uh, the Lutherans got together. And remember I said a while back that there's other reformations going on too? That there's other, there's other guys messing around. And... The German princes say, well, maybe if we're doing this over here and these guys are doing this over here and we both disagree with the Pope well, and the Emperor, maybe we should band together and make some sort of an alliance. And this, this is the princes that are thinking this, the, the, the princes. And they, they take that to, to Luther and to the other, the other theologians. And the theologians say, well, uh, it's a good idea, but the reason why we have been over here doing this and they've been over there doing that is because um, we actually have some serious theological differences. And if we are going to stand together, we need to hammer out our theological differences. If we want to unite our armies, we need to be of the same mindset when it comes to theology. Again, a different world than we have now, where we say everybody has their own kind of the way of doing things, what difference does it make? No, in this time, 
If you want to band together with an army or uh, a political alliance, there needs to be a, a religious alliance as well. And so the Lutherans get together, the theologians, Luther and others, they get together and they draft up these articles uh, called the Schwabach Articles, and they're really very good. Really very good. Uh, however, uh, if the Lutherans are over here doing this, and the Anabaptists who don't baptize babies are over here doing this, well, guess what sort of things they don't agree on? You know, baptism, the Lord's Supper. And what ends up happening is there's no, there's no alliance. There's no army alliance. Um, there is among the Lutherans, but there's not among like, the Lutherans and the ba Anabaptists and, and things like that. Um, that's what happened. Well, they try again. Uh, it says here in 1529, Luther, Melanchthon, and Zwingli meet for Marburg Colloquy. All right, so one of the princes says, all right, if we can't get everybody together, let's at least get us and the Swiss together. So Luther uh, goes to Marburg, and there's Zwingli there, and there's a, another guy named Martin Busser. And I referenced this a couple weeks back. Remember when I was talking about how Luther... Uh, took a piece of chalk and wrote uh, hoc est corpus meum on the table. Um, this is my body. They, at Marburg, it all came to nothing because they could not agree on the Lord's Supper. Right? So, uh, no religious alliance, no, no army alliance. That falls apart as well. Well, then add to the fray the Ottoman Empire. And if this is confusing, it's, it's confusing by design. I'm, I'm trying to express how much is going on in this time. This is by design. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was in Turkey, uh, and their religion was Islam. And they, they were of the conquering sort. And right at this time, they have taken Hungary, and they're headed toward Vienna. And if they take Vienna, they're going to take Europe. That's what's going to happen. If they've taken Hungary, they're already kind of into Europe, and Austria, you know, or Vienna, Austria is like the last step. Uh, and it says there on the timeline that they're unsuccessful, right? Uh, but they are not, uh, they don't give up. So, uh, now the emperor comes back in. And he says, all right, we've got this Lutheran Catholic thing going on, uh, but what's more serious is we have the Ottoman Empire beating down our door. And they don't care if you're Lutheran or if you're Catholic, they're going to kill us. Uh, and so we have a duty as Christians to unite so that we can defend our towns and kill the Turks. Uh, is more or less what he says. Uh, so, you Lutherans, uh, you are going to come to Augsburg in 1530, and you are going to make nice. That you are going to uh, fall in line with the teachings of the Pope, and then together, we're going to defend our land and kill the Turk. It's pretty much his words. I'm, I'm a little, you know, making up a little bit, but... Uh, that's essentially what's going on. So, they get called the Augsburg, 1530. And it says here on the timeline that the Torgau Articles are drafted. And what those are, are a series of articles. Initially, the Lutheran plan was to go to Augsburg and say, uh, we are not a new church. Uh, we are, are not... Uh, a sect, you know, we are not doing something strange, uh, but we are, we are Christians, we are part of the Catholic Church. And these Torgo articles were a series of articles explaining, uh, we're not doing weird stuff, you know, and we want to be united. So they prepare these Torgo articles, and, and they get to Augsburg, and the Torgo articles, there's about 15, 15 articles of stuff. Uh, they're short. And they get to Augsburg. And there's this guy. His name is John Eck. 
And John Eck is a character. Um, he very smart, very smart, but also a little tricksy. And when Lutherans get to Augsburg, in good faith, uh, ready to talk to the emperor about how we can unite and, and end these differences, because it's not our goal to destroy the church, um, they get to Augsburg, and John Eck, who is a Roman Catholic, he put together a document called, uh, what is it, the, the 404, what was it, 404 statements? Yeah, if you got there, good. And, and it's 404, why 404, I don't know. But it's 404 statements that are attributed to Luther uh, that are meant to show how Luther and the Lutherans are all crazy heretics. And some, some, of it, you know, some of them were things that Luther actually said. Most of them were, you know, if you copy-paste from here, uh, you know, and put things together. Uh, or a lot of times what Eck would do would take things that other people had said, he would make them worse, and then he'd put Luther's name behind it. Uh, and things like, and just ridiculous sort of stuff. However, people read, you know, people read that and said, oh, yeah, that Luther guy is a wild man. We got to be done with this guy. So the Lutherans get to Augsburg, and they find this being published out, uh, you know, out in the world, and they go, all right, we got a bigger problem here. Because originally our plan was to just, you know, tell the emperor that, you know, here are, here are things that we have changed, right? Um, but it is not our intention or our desire uh, to, to create a new church. Uh, you know, we don't see ourselves as cut off from Christian history. We see ourselves as holding to the, the teaching that has always been expressed in the Christian church. Uh, however, with the 404 uh, articles come out, they say, all right, we got to shift gears. And now, not only do we have to have a short statement, we need to have a full confession of what we believe and teach. We are now in this position where we need to confess the faith. You know, uh, that this has been amped up. So, they get together, and uh, using the Schwabach articles, and the Marburg articles, and then these Torgau articles, uh, they craft what is eventually going to be called the Augsburg Confession, which is the, I guess, the Lutheran statement of faith par excellence. What is it? What is a Lutheran? What does a Lutheran believe? Why does the Lutheran Church exist? That's what the Augsburg Confession is. Uh, Luther did not write this. Uh, technically, it was written by a guy named Philip Melanchthon, uh, who actually set pen to paper, but he used previous resources, and Luther at this time was still an outlaw. Uh, so he was made an outlaw in 1521. This is now 1530. Luther remains an outlaw his entire life. Uh, you know, the, the papal bull excommunicating Luther uh, is still, uh, it's still official, still valid, uh, and the papal bull that excommunicated Luther, guess what, it also excommunicates us. Uh, anybody who follows the teaching of Luther, uh, that's still official. You, you can Google it and read it, and uh, it'll make your day. Um, that's still in the books. But Luther did not was not at Augsburg, but there was a special courier service set up that Luther wrote something like, I don't know, 100 letters or something like that, back and forth, that they had a dedicated courier between Augsburg and where Luther was. Uh, and so he... He was very well informed upon the writing of the Augsburg Confession, and at times he would say, uh, it doesn't have my name on it, but it's mine. You know, and, and later in history, when he reflected back on it, he's like, I wasn't there, but those are my teachings. Um, this is what I teach and, and believe. And so, uh, 1530, June, was it June 25th, 1530? Uh, they're in Augsburg. And normally when they would do something like this, they would get together in this big auditorium that could be filled with, with people, right? Uh, big public happening. Well, when this goes down, they're in a little room that holds like 200 people, and half of them are like the emperor's entourage. Uh, however, it's summer, and the Lutherans come up with the idea of, it's hot here, let's open the windows. So they do. 
And outside this room are crowds of people. Crowds of people. Uh, hundreds gathered outside these open windows because they want to hear what's going on. And the emperor uh, calls upon them uh, because in these days, uh, this was all going to be spoken out loud. Uh, what we're going to be reading over the next forever uh, was all spoken out loud. It took a couple hours, uh, actually. Uh, and the emperor calls upon them, and originally the plan was going to be, uh, whenever you do something like this, you're going to deliver it in Latin. Uh, but the Lutherans go, we're in Germany. Let's do it in German. And the emperor said, all right, fine. Uh, the emperor, by the way, falls asleep during this. Uh, but he says, okay, fine. So then the Lutherans say, who do we got that is the loudest guy we can find? And they, they find him. I think it's a Brook, I think his name is, what's the B? Bruick. Uh, but they find him, and he was well known for being loud. Uh, and they get this guy, they give him the Augsburg Confession, and he reads it out loud in German, super loud. Everybody out in the streets hears this. Uh, and this all goes down. Uh, you know, uh, if you've seen the handsome Luther movie, uh, there's one scene at the end where they read the Augsburg Confession, and and the emperor, who himself was kind of handsome, he's like, "Don't you do that!" And they all they all bow down their heads, you know, to get cut off. But that goes down. That's that Bruit guy. Uh, only it happens in a different context. It's still happening in Augsburg there, uh, and he and the, the emperor are having conversation, and. You know, he says, you know, I rather than give up this confession, I'd rather have my head cut off. And uh, the emperor, who didn't speak German, he, he, he cobbled together enough German to say, uh, uh, what, no cut off, no cut off, or something. That's all, about all he could say in German. Uh, and so Lutherans deliver uh, the, this confession. Uh, and from then on, there's been such a thing as the Lutheran Church. Right. So like I said, nothing happened between 1517 and 1580. Um, this is a very confusing and high-level um, kind of overview, and I'm sure I've made mistakes, but you, you get the gist of um, things go on, things happen. Right. Uh, so let's turn to the Augsburg Confession, and, and we'll hear Melanchthon deliver this in his own words, and he can do it much clearer than, than, than I have here. Um, let's turn to the preface. Now, if you're following online, you can go to our website, stjohnsandgracelp.com. Click on the, re the tab that says Resources for those at home, uh, and then scroll down to the Augsburg Confession. Uh, you can download that. It's going to be an older translation, but it, you should still be able to follow along. Uh, I'm going to use the purse edition here, uh, which should be the page in the big edition should be about 27. Um, if you have a first edition of this, so lower back there, your page might be different. Uh, but it should be the preface to the Augsburg Confession. There is a preface to the Book of Concord, but this is the preface to the Augsburg Confession. Okay. And here Melanchthon is going to talk about all these things. Uh, but Melanchthon was a professor, and so he, he's uh, more lucid in his thought uh, than I am, and he's able to put it together. Paragraph 1 says, Most invincible emperor, oh, by the way, to emperors Chuck V, Charles V, who was uh, Spanish. Most invincible emperor, Caesar Augustus, most clement lord, your imperial majesty has summoned a meeting of the empire here at Augsburg to consider taking action against the Turk, discussing how best to stand effectively against his fury and attacks by means of military force. The Turk is the most atrocious and ancient hereditary enemy of the Christian name and religion. This meeting is also to consider disagreements in our holy religion, the Christian faith by hearing everyone's opinions and judgments in each other's presence. They are to be considered and evaluated among ourselves in mutual charity, mercy, and kindness, after the removal and correction of things that either side has understood differently, 
These matters may be settled and brought back to one simple truth and Christian concord. Then we may embrace and maintain the future of one pure and true religion under one Christ, doing battle under him, living in unity and concord in the one Christian church. Right, so how would you, uh, what's the tone of these first opening paragraphs? You know, does uh, Melanchthon come out, did the Lutherans come out swinging? Or uh, what would you say maybe the tones, so even just in the first little bit here? Cool. Calm and inviting to be one with the power. Yeah. Do, they, do the Lutherans sound like they want to fight? Yeah. No. No, and in fact, that's sometimes been the characterization of, of Lutherans and maybe of the Missouri Synod, is that, you know, we're a little high strung and we want to get out there and, 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 and fight, and, and we do. Uh, you know, but here from the outset, the Lutheran position is not one of, of, of fighting and, and, and conflict, but of peace. You know, one way that Melanchthon was described was uh, as irenic. And do you know what that means? If somebody's named Irene, that comes from the Greek, and it means peace, peaceful. You know, uh, the goal of, of the Lutherans is not to start a new church, not to go their own way, but to peacefully teach and live in the true teaching of Scripture. You know, uh, and, and we seek unity. We seek peace and, and love. Uh, Philadelphia, right? Uh, among Christian brothers and sisters. You know? and, and maybe in, in Lutheranism and, and in the Missouri Synod, we're, we're unique and still striving after that. You know? uh, that there is such a thing as true theological unity. Uh, and we have that among ourselves, and we hope to have that you know, with, with all Christians. And, and we, we labor after that. Unfortunately, you know, the devil is also active in the world. Uh, but when the Lutherans come to Augsburg, the goal is not to stir things up. You know, but to peacefully and humbly confess you know, the true teachings of, of Scripture and to be united with, you know, with all Christians. Paragraph 5. Question, yeah. are you reading the translation from the German or Latin? Uh, this is going to be the German. Okay. Uh, yeah, if if you're reading the reader's edition uh, here, and if you're reading the digital one at home, uh, that is going to be from the German. Uh, the Augsburg Confession, uh, it was read in German, uh, but it was also then delivered to the emperor in Latin and in German. Uh, and uh, the Book of Concord was published in 1580 in German, 1584 in Latin, and both are official. They're both authoritative. There are some differences, uh, but for, for our study here, um, we don't really need to dive into that too much. Um, so if you have the reader's edition, it's going to be German. If you have the Kolb Wanger, you're going to have both there. Um, yeah, the, uh, the original, the originals are gone. Uh, because uh, some parties aligned with the Roman Catholic Church burned them somewhere along the line. So. And not very long after they were delivered. Uh, in about the 1560s is when they, uh, they kind of dis the originals disappear. Uh, and uh, one of the parties responsible, uh, he, he was pretty happy about it. So, uh, so they disappear. But we have earlier other editions, and people were taking notes while this was all being read. So we're not worried about that too much. But paragraph five. We, the undersigned elector and princes, so when we get to the end, it's not theologians who sign this. It's princes, governors, politicians we would call now. Uh, this is not theologians who sign this. Interesting, interesting note. We, the undersigned elector and princes, have been called to this gathering along with the other electors, princes, and estates in obedient compliance with the imperial mandate. Therefore, we have promptly come to Augsburg. We do not mean to boast when we say this, but we were among the first to be here. Yeah, so the emperor calls this gathering in April, uh, and he has it set for June. 
because there's travel time. Well, the, uh, the call goes out mid-April. The Lutherans pack up and they get to Augsburg about the first week of May. The emperor doesn't roll into town until midway through June. And it's like, we got the call and we came right away. You know, we, we want to meet, we want to talk about this. You know, our desire is not to cause problems. At the very beginning, the sixth, of the meeting in Augsburg, your imperial majesty made a proposal to the electors, princes and other estates of the empire. Among other things, you asked that the several estates of the empire, on the strength of the, of the imperial edict, would submit their explanations, opinions, and judgments in German and Latin. On the following Wednesday, we informed your imperial majesty that after due deliberation, we could present the articles of our confession in one week. Therefore, concerning this religious matter, we offer this confession. It is ours and our preachers. It shows from the holy scriptures and God's pure word what has been up to this time presented in our lands, dukedoms, dominions, and cities, and taught in our churches. In keeping with your edict, the other electors, princes, and estates of the empire may present similar writings in Latin and German, giving their opinions in this religious matter. We, and those princes previously mentioned, are prepared to discuss, in a friendly manner, all possible ways and means by which we may come together. We will do this in the presence of your imperial majesty, our most clement lord. In this way, dissensions may be put away without offensive conflict. This can be done honorably, with God's help, so that we may be brought back to agreement and conflict. As your edict shows, we are all under one Christ and do battle under him. We ought to confess the one Christ and do everything according to God's truth. With the most fervent prayers, this is what we ask of God. However, regarding the rest of the electors, princes, and estates who form the other side, no progress may be made, nor any result achieved by this treatment of religious matters, as your imperial majesty has wisely determined that it should be dealt with and treated by mutual presentation of writings and a calm conferring together among ourselves. We will at least leave with you a clear testimony. We are not holding back from anything that could bring about Christian concord, such as could be affected by God or with God and a good conscience. Now, I read over that paragraph pretty quickly. We said that we, we've noticed from these words that there, there, there's a peaceful demeanor here. Uh, there's a desire on the part of the Lutherans to, to be united in heart and mind with with all the Christians, um, they, they came to this diet, uh, joy, you know, with a zeal uh, to be united, heart and mind, to, to discuss peacefully and in a godly fashion these differences that we may have so that we can put them together. But in paragraph 12, they kind of drop the mic a little bit. Because what do they say in paragraph 12? And maybe 13 as well. Who's, who's uh, blocking the stream here? Is it the Lutherans that are not wanting to budge, or what? who's causing problems, according to them? The other. Yeah, the, other, the others. Uh, you know, and I think they mean primarily the, the Roman Catholic theologians. That we are doing everything that we can to be united. You know, everything that can happen with a good conscience and according to God's will, we are doing everything. Uh, but we're afraid that the other side is not interested. And so we are going to leave with you, dear Emperor, this confession of our faith, and we trust that you will see the, the, the truth of our teachings and, and side with us that we're not doing weird stuff. Uh, we hope that you will read this, find that this is the true teaching of Scripture, and inside with us. You know, allow us to continue preaching and teaching. You know. 14. Your imperial majesty and the other electors and estates of the empire and all moved by sincere love and zeal for religion who will give an impartial hearing to this matter. 
please graciously offer to take notice of this and to understand this from our confession. Your Imperial Majesty has, not once, but often, graciously pointed something out to the electors, princes, and estates of the empire. At the meeting of Spire, 1526, the first one, according to the form of your imperial instruction and commission, this point was given and prescribed. Your imperial majesty caused it to be stated and publicly proclaimed that your majesty, in dealing with this religious matter, for certain reasons that were alleged in your majesty's name, was not willing to decide could not determine anything, but that your majesty would diligently use your majesty's office with the Roman pontiff, the pope, for the convening of a general council. The same matter was publicly set forth at greater length a year ago, at the last meeting of the empire at Spire 1529. There your imperial majesty, through his highness Ferdinand, king of Bohemia and Hungary, uh, who is the brother of Charles, uh, our friend and clement lord, as well as through the orator and imperial commissioners, caused the following to be submitted among other things. Concerning the calling of a council, your imperial majesty had taken notice of and has pondered the resolution of A, your majesty's representative in the empire, and of B, the president and imperial counselors, and C, the legates from other estates convened at Radisbon. Your Imperial Majesty also judged that it was helpful to convene a council. Your Imperial Majesty did not doubt that the Roman Pontiff could be persuaded to hold a general council. For the matters between your Imperial Majesty and the Roman Pontiff were nearing agreement and Christian reconciliation. Your Imperial Majesty himself pointed out that he would work to secure the said Chief Pontiff's the Pope's consent for convening a general council to gather with your imperial majesty to be announced as soon as possible by letters that were to be sent out. Okay, brief, coffee break. Five minutes, okay. Let me add that for a second, then we'll finish the preface and that will set us up for next week. Uh, there's a C word that we heard mentioned like three or four times in that, in that last little chunk. What, what was that C word? Hmm? Clement, okay. Oh, and there's another C word. It starts with a C and an O. Council. Council. Does anybody know what that is? They reference it a couple times that the, that the emperor was talking about holding a general council and that he was going to talk to the pope about holding a general council. Does anybody know what that is? Is that like the Council of Nicaea? Mm -hmm. tell, tell us more. Where they would gather all the church leaders from all over and discuss issues of the day. Yes, a diet, or a diet, I guess, is a gathering called together by the emperor for his princes and other political parties, things like that. A council is a gathering of all, the whole church. The whole church. And this has happened throughout history. Uh, in fact, there are seven of them, seven what are called the seven ecumenical councils that happened from uh, Nicaea, which is in 325. We say the Nicene Creed. That comes from the Council of Nicaea and, and then some following ones. But from 325 to about the 700s, there are these, these councils that are gathering to the whole church that we all recognize, whether you know it or not, um, the councils had, had a big impact on your faith whether you know it or not. There have been other councils that are not recognized by us, but are recognized by the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and the Lutherans believe that if the emperor did not want to settle this himself, the emperor has the authority to call a council of the whole church on earth, and we'll take it to the church. We Lutherans will take it to the church. Let, let all the other bishops throughout the world, let them hear our case and decide whether we're right or not. And the emperor says, you know, that might not be a bad idea, but I think you're wrong about who can call this. I think it needs to be the pope. And the pope doesn't want to call it because he doesn't want to give the Lutherans a fair shake, more or less. He, he, do, he doesn't want the Lutheran teaching to spread or to be heard. Instead, 
Lutheranism is heresy. Luther is a heresy. Anybody who follows Luther, heretic going to hell. Uh, and so the, the emperor said, no way, I'll keep trying. Right? And we're going to hear this in the August Confession. There's going to be a few times this is going to come up, that we, we're, we're ready to go before the whole church. You know, if you don't want emperor, we believe that you can decide it. If you don't want to decide it, put, put, it, put us before the whole church on earth. And, and we'll confess this faith. And, and everyone will see this is what the Bible teaches. Um, you know, and so the Pope does eventually call a council. Luther dies in 1545. 46. What is it? 45, 46. The council happens right after Luther dies. And it goes from about 1546 to uh, 1563, off and on. Uh, this is called the Council of Trent, uh, where basically uh, they uh, poo-poo everything Lutheran. That Lutheranism and Luther teaching does come up, and they condemn it as a whole. Luther as well, you know, they, they don't, they're not interested in discussing Lutheranism, you know, truly. They, they, they bring it up only to condemn it. Um, the Council of Trent, you can find it very easily, uh, still in the books, has not been taken back. So the, the decrees that they make at this council, uh, you know, still there. Um, then, you know, then there's another one that we might know. Um, the next council is going to be in the 1800s. Um, and that's where they make official that uh, Mary was assumed into, into heaven, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and that Mary was immaculately conceived, that comes from a council in the 1800s. Uh, and then most of us who are here, not Faith and I, but uh, pretty much, well, maybe not Faith either. Um, Vatican II happened in the 60s. And, and we would know that from, you know, switching to Latin English. You know, that's mostly why we would know. Um, that, that's a council, uh, you know, and uh, we can use Vatican II, for example, the Luther, we had representatives there. The Missouri Synod had representatives there uh, who could be observers, but did not get to, you know, discuss, really. You know, the same thing, but the Lutherans, that's what they're referring to. The council is a gathering of, of the whole church that, you know, the emperor, we believe that you can decide this. You, you're a smart guy. You can read this and see... We're not teaching something different than the Bible teaches. We're not teaching something that the church has always taught. Uh, you can decide this, but if you if you don't want to decide it, uh, you have offered to call a council. Do it. We're, we're ready. You know. All right. Let's finish this. Twenty one. Therefore, if the outcome should be in Augsburg that the differences between us and the other parties in this religious matter should not be settled with friendliness and charity, then here, before your imperial majesty, we obediently offer, in addition to what we have already done, to appear and defend our cause in such a general free Christian council. There has always been harmonious action and agreement among the electors, princes, and other estates to hold a council in all the imperial meetings held during your majesty's reign. Even before this time, we have appealed this great and grave matter to the assembly of this general council and to your imperial majesty in appropriate manner. We will stand by this appeal both to your imperial majesty and to a council. We have no intention to abandon our appeal with this or any other document. This would not be possible unless the matter between us and the other side is settled with friendliness and charity, resolved and brought to Christian harmony according to the latest imperial citation. In regard to this appeal, we solemnly and publicly testify here. <clears throat> so we're off to a peaceful start. That's a lot of information. I apologize. Um, if you're watching live, you can rewind and look at this again. People, the people who are here in the pews uh, have braved through it and haven't fallen asleep yet. Um, I was expecting that, but it, it didn't happen, so I'll try harder next week. Uh, suffice to say... Nothing happens between 1517 and 1580. Nothing, nothing at all happens. Um, and everything goes great. Well, that's not true. A lot happens, and not everything goes great. And the Lutherans are, uh, are called to Augsburg. 
uh, where they confess the faith, that Lutheranism is not a new teaching, it's not a different teaching. Lutheranism is the pure preaching and teaching of God's Word. Uh, we are in line with the, with the Catholic Church of all time, small c, lowercase c, right, uh, that Lutheranism is the true teaching of Scripture. Uh, it's what our Lutheran pastors, at least in the Missouri Synod, uh, have to promise uh, and vow, and it's what you guys all vowed in your confirmation vows. Uh, you all vowed it. Uh, and so next week, we're going to start with the author of confession. And uh, it's going to start with, with God. What, what do Lutherans believe about God? And some parts of the author of confession are going to be pretty, pretty easy. There's going to be stuff that you're going to be like, oh, obviously. Um, there's going to be some stuff toward the middle and end that we might have to break down and be like, okay, what does that mean? Uh, but there's going to be some stuff initially that you're going to go, well, that makes sense. That's what the Bible says. So uh, that would be, be pretty cool. So we're going to dive into that next week. Um, are there any closing thoughts uh, or, uh, or rebuttals or uh, criticism? It's a lot of information, I'm sorry. At seminary, they make us take a 10-week class on this, and we just did it in an hour. <laughs> so, uh, if you're watching the live stream and you, uh, and you got bored, I apologize. Next week will be better, but we, it was important for us to get history so we know kind of what is riding on this. Um, that said, let us uh, then close with prayer. Gracious Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the gift uh, of faith which you have worked in us by your Holy Spirit. Uh, that by faith you direct our eyes to you, to your cross, and to your death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins and so that we might have eternal life. We thank you that for generations uh, faithful Christians have gone before us to, to faithfully confess the faith. And especially today do we thank you for those, those brave men who stood before the emperor to confess the faith who showed that what Lutherans believe and teach and confess is nothing different than what your word freely and clearly has said for all time. We ask that as of those who have gone before us, you would keep us also steadfast in this faith. We ask that by your Holy Spirit you would give us a fervent love for you and for your word, and also for those whom you have placed in our lives, that the faith in you then leads us to care for. We ask that you be with us this day as we go about the work of our vocations, and grant that those things that we say and do may be pleasing in your sight. In your name we pray. Amen.